good afternoon and welcome to the september public health practice grand rounds my name is molly mitchell and on behalf of the mid atlantic public health training center and the maryland department of health and mental hygiene i'd like to welcome everyone to today's presentation on the food safety modernization act the new law and what it means for our health um, before we begin today's presentation uh, i have just a few notes uh, for you who are joining us online um, please, if you have a question at any point during this presentation, you can simply click on the link on your screen and email us in your question for either of our presenters. Um, we also invite you to look on our website on some of our online trainings that we have available, such as Public Health Nursing um, and Public Health 101. And also wanted to draw your attention to some of our upcoming trainings, which include Logic Modeling on October 11th, Grant Writing, on November 3rd and team building on November 8th. Um, and also just to let you know, our next public health practice grand rounds will be on October 12th, which is a little bit off our usual schedule and that will be looking at the new tobacco or cigarette uh, warning labels. So with that, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce our two presenters for today. Sharon Mail joined the FDA in 1994 as a senior policy advisor in the office of policy in the office of the commissioner. While her primary focus has been food safety and imports, she has worked on a variety of FDA issues, including tobacco, medical device user fees, food labeling, and dietary supplements. Ms. Mail currently serves as Senior Advisor for Food Policy to the Deputy Commissioner for Foods, where she advises on issues related to food safety and nutrition. She's currently working on implementation of the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. She also currently chairs the Foods Regulation and Policy Steering Committee, which oversees significant policy initiatives in the foods program. In addition to her work on foods issues, Ms. Mail recently served as a co-chair of the Commissioner's Globalization Strategy Working Group, which produced the report Pathway to Global Product Safety and Quality. Ms. Mail is a graduate of Cornell University and Harvard Law School. Prior to joining the agency, she worked first in private practice and then for a public interest advocacy group. Keeve Notchman is an assistant scientist with a primary appointment in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences and a joint appointment in the Department of Health Policy and Management. Prior to joining the JHSPH faculty, Dr. Notchman completed a postdoctoral fellowship with the Environmental Protection Agency as an environmental health scientist in the National Center for Environmental Economics and worked as a toxicologist and risk assessor for the United States Army Corps of Engineers. In addition to his academic role, Dr. Notchman directs the Farming for the Futures program at the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future where he investigates a variety of issues related to the industrial model of food production. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ms. Mail. So good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you so much for inviting me here today to participate in your ground rounds uh, discussion. Um, I think I'm going to start by giving you an overview of, of the act and how we're implementing it at um, FDA. Um, this statute was a long time coming, just by way of background, um, for those that might not know. The original Food and Drug Act, um, the Pure Food and Drug Act, was passed in 1906 and um, has remained uh, relatively unchanged until this act was passed. There were tweaks here and there after 9-11 for some bioterrorism things and a few things here and there, but we were essentially operating under the same authorities um, as we were um, in 1906. Um, and just, um, you know, this, this has been a high priority of this administration. President Obama, one of the first uh, acts he did was form a food safety working group which pulled together um, various agencies that work um, on food agency, USDA, EPA, um, many different agencies to, to sort of tackle some of the food safety problems. Um, and when the commissioner was, was first appointed, it was right in the middle of the peanut butter um, outbreak, and he was introducing her as the new commissioner, and I am told, although I was not there, that he basically leaned over and said the current status quo is, is not acceptable um, and that we really need to make some improvements in food safety. So um, um, it's, I've been at the agency a long time, I have to say. This, um, it's a very exciting time to work there. There are a lot of changes going on, um, and I will tell you a little bit about it. This act was passed in January. Um, of this year after a, uh, a lot of negotiating between many different sides and many different interest groups. 
Um, so I'll give you an overview of, of what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about why the law is needed, um, both from uh, the public health imperative uh, of why it was needed and also the, some changes that have been going on that really made this, these changes and an updating of our authorities a necessity. Um, I will describe um, the, the provisions of the law and um, how they work together. And then I'll let you, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how the agency is going ahead to implement um, this new law. So um, I'm sure these numbers are probably not very new to many of you in, in this room. These numbers come out of CDC. 48 million people, that's one in um, every six people, um, will get sick um, every year from uh, foodborne illness. And out of those, uh, 128,000, um, more or less, will be hospitalized, and um, 3,000 will die from foodborne illness. And as you know, there are certain populations that are uh, more susceptible, infants, um, young children, the elderly, uh, pregnant women, the immune compromised. So there, um, there are many people who are more at risk for these kinds of illnesses. And I also probably don't need to tell um, many of you in this room that this is more than just a stomach ache, although sometimes it is just a stomach ache. People can end up, end up with um, debilitating, debilitating uh, conditions that can really um, last uh, their lifetime. But there's also been some sort of changes that have been going on in the world that also make this act really a necessity. And the first one is has to do with the uh, percent of food that we import in this country. 15% of all the food consumed in this country um, is imported, but significantly a lot of the food that's imported is higher risk food. So we're talking about 80% of seafood is imported, 40 to 50% of fruits, and about 10 to 20% of uh, vegetables. So produce is another uh, area, which I'm sure you all know, um, comes from other countries um, throughout the year. Um, our food supply has changed dramatically. It's more technologically advanced um, and complex, both in terms of the products that we see in, in the market and also the supply chains um, that get them there. They've become much more complex and harder to control. So we're seeing new pathogens come in from other countries, um, and we're also seeing old pathogens show up in new places. Um, so that's um, been a concern. So there's been a lot of changes um, that have been going on. And also, I talked a little bit about the at-risk population um, and that population is growing with people living longer, with um, you know new drug regimens that are making people immune compromised. So those populations are also growing. Uh, we at the Food and Drug Administration keep saying, "Oh, this law is historic. It's 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 you know the, the well we, we do say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but <laughs> but we uh, it's it's really been a significant change. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what this law means. Um, one of the basic tenets of the law is that it, it, it aims to create a system that addresses the whole spectrum of food safety issues from farm to table and taking into account each player's role along, along the line. Um, and it seeks to hold each player in that supply chain accountable, um, responsible and accountable for what they're doing. So whether you're the grower or whether you're the person putting it in a package or or um, you know, all through the supply chain. When I talk about the supply chain, I'm really talking about sort of where it's produced, starting from raw ingredients all the way through to consumption. So the law seeks to address that whole supply chain. Um, probably the most significant reform, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, is, is our change to our import authorities. Um, historically, FDA's approach to imports has been um, stuff comes in, you see it at the ports. I, I've been at this port, actually, um, with the commissioner touring it. You know, truck uh, cargo loads of food comes in, and we try to catch problems as, it's, as they're coming across the border. Um, that no longer works. It might have worked when the act was passed, and we were importing things like molasses and spices and sugar, which were incorporated into other products and fairly low risk. But now that we're importing you know, raspberries and cantaloupes and, and you know, sea bass and all kinds of things, um, catching things at the border really isn't an approach. Is what, um, what's going to work anymore. So this new law um, basically takes us from that approach to one where both the importer and the foreign producer are going to be held a lot more accountable for the kinds of um, uh, foods that they produce. Um, we, the law also recognized that we really can't do um, this alone. Um, and there's a significant emphasis on partnerships and leveraging of resources. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but this is a big job, um, protecting the food supply. And I, I also should probably mention that FDA regulates does not regulate um, meat and poultry. 
regulates the other, that's about 20% of the food supply, we regulate the other 80%, which includes seafood, um, but doesn't include domesticated animals. Um, so there is, a, there is a split there, which I should let you know about. Um, and finally, I think the other big thing about this legislation is, is sort of how it got passed. You got a coalition of industry and consumer groups, public health groups, um, bipartisan support in Congress. It really was remarkable, the efforts um, that it took to pass this law and really that it, that it passed it all and, and the coalition that came together. Um, it took all those, uh, all those uh, different interest groups to pass the law and it's gonna take all those interest groups to really um, make it work. So the main themes of the legislation really uh, can be divided into four areas. Um, prevention, inspections and compliance and response, import safety and enhanced partnerships. And, and a food safety system really depends on all four of these components if it's gonna work. And, and as uh, I think we'll just get started talking about each of those components. Um, let's start with prevention. So it's these um, authorities that we got in the area of prevention that really is the key to the success. It's, it's the building block of, of the whole law. I think we've learned after decades of chasing after food safety problems after they arise that that's really not gonna be the answer. What we really do, need to do is prevent them um, before, uh, before they get to consumers. So we need to um, move more toward a preventive system and away from one that's, that's reactive. So one of the basic tenets of the law is that food companies, and this may be shocking to you that they didn't have to do this before, but they have to have in place a food safety plan that puts um, into place uh, preventive controls. So it involves, the, it involves them identifying the hazards that can occur, putting the preventive controls in place, monitoring the effectiveness of the uh, preventive controls, um, fixing problems when they do occur, and keeping records of everything that they do. Um, that might seem like a basic, uh, tenant of how you might produce food safely, but that was something that was not um, previously required in all sectors. We did have some experience and put some regulations in place with respect to juice and, and uh, seafood, which were continuing problems, but, we, but across the food supply, that was never a mandate for food companies. Um, in the area of produce, we, will, we are required to establish science-based uh, standards for the safe growing, harvesting, and packing of produce. And we will also have to put in place regulations um, to protect against intentional contamination of the food supply. So that would include both um, acts of terrorism, but also sort of tampering issues that you hear about from disgruntled employees and, and other ways. But people who intend to harm, as opposed to other areas where things accidentally um, occur or they naturally occur within, within a food. Um, and I don't know, and I, I'm just going to take a few seconds, if I can, to sort of explain to those of you that aren't lawyers, um, sort of how the regulatory process works. An act gets, gets passed. Um, it has very broad mandates of the type that I'm describing. And then we, as a regulatory agency, have to figure out really how to implement it and, and write regulations, um, which are more detailed um, requirements for companies and how they have to comply with these, with these um, broader mandates. And so what we do is we publish proposed regulations and there's a comment period, and we'll talk a little bit about that, because that's where you guys can, can come in a little bit, um, where people have an opportunity to comment on our regulations, and we consider those comments, and then we finalize them. Um, we also sometimes issue um, guidance documents, which help industry comply. They're not binding. Um, but um, that's sort of how the process works. So I'm sort of starting at the, the law level. Um, we're in the process of writing these regulations, and so I can't talk too much about the details of those. But, um, but I just wanted to take to help you understand sort of how it works um, at a regulatory agency. <clears throat> so in the area of inspection, compliance, and response, um, I think no matter how good the preventive controls are that are in place, I think we all know that problems will arise occasionally, hopefully less frequently as, as we move forward with this. Um, but, but problems do arise, and, and this <clears throat> excuse me, new law has given us significant new authorities and tools to deal with those problems that we didn't have before. Um, just in terms of inspections, the law calls for uh, more frequent risk-based inspections of domestic facilities and also an increased presence abroad so that we get, um, we get to some of the foreign facilities that are exporting. There's about 200,000 um, facilities that export to the United States, so that's, that's a lot of facilities. We certainly don't have the resources to get to all of them, but the Act does call for a more significant presence overseas. Um, and we also have some new enforcement tools. Um, it may surprise some of you to know that we did not have the authority to mandatory, uh, 
um, to, to require a recall of foods. When there was a problem, when you hear of recalls of foods, they, are, they have in the past been voluntary. Um, we now have the authority if a company refuses to, um, to recall a product voluntarily that is posing a health hazard, we have the ability to order them to do so. We have uh, more authority to look at their records, another um, thing that might be surprising to you. We could inspect the facility and not really look at what records they kept, but now we have the ability to do that on, and look at their preventive, their food safety plans and, and look at those records. Um, we also have the ability now um, to um, detain unsafe products without going through courts. We can do it what we call administratively, so we don't have to go to court and argue that we, we should be stopping this product. We can do it more quickly. Um, and more efficiently. We can also suspend the, the uh, registration of a facility. You can't ship food if you're not registered, so if we suspend your registration, um, you can no longer ship food. That, uh, that is a new tool in our toolkit um, that we can use in, in cases, this would be a more extreme case, but it's a way to also help um, make sure that food is not reaching consumers. And we have some new authority um, to be able to track food, track and trace authority. Um, which involves record keeping and, and things like that, that we can also require of companies and also require that certain foods be tested in, um, in only accredited laboratories to ensure that they're, they meet very high standards. So I talked a little bit about import safety and why this is such a groundbreaking um, shift. Um, we really do have unprecedented authority over those that import foods uh, right now. Our authority over the people that actually bring it in um, was, was quite limited before. But now, for the first time, importers will have um, a requirement that they have to ensure that the food that they're bringing in, that the food supply, that the whole supply chain um, meets our standards. Um, so it, it's, it's, it, it, um, we call it the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. So basically, they have to verify that the people from which um, they're buying food have these preventive controls in place that, that all facilities have to have. And it takes, it's just another tool. It doesn't really replace us going over and checking. But with 200,000 facilities, we're not going to be able to check them all. And it puts another burden um, of, of people that we do have jurisdiction over in the United States to basically do that checking for us and penalties it if they don't. Um, we are also um, required to um, set up a third-party certification program. Um, and again, I, I think this is one of the more significant provisions in the, in the Act. I talked a little bit about um, partnerships and how we can't do it alone. Um, the, you can imagine if there's 200 foreign facilities, how many there are domestically. I think it doesn't, um, you've read the news, um, federal money is not, um, is not forthcoming, is not increasing anytime soon. I think we really have to think about how we leverage the private sector systems um, that are already in place. A lot of food companies, um, the big ones that you know, that you see their brand name on, they're already requiring that they're, the people that ship them food be um, audited by private auditors. And um, this act allows us to take advantage of the safety systems that they already have in place and leverage them to our advantage. It allows, it allows importers to rely on them, um, and it allows us in certain cir um, circumstances to also rely on the private third-party system. Um, and for foods that cause a particular problem, um, I don't, I don't want to name any, but there are foods that consistently come in and cause a problem, we can now say to the people who are importing them that you cannot, it, it can't come in at all unless it's certified by a reliable third party. Um, and that's new. It used to be that it would come in and we would have something called an import alert and then they could test it to see if it was safe. But I think those who have any experience with, um, with micro contamination in produce know that testing of a pallet of strawberries over here doesn't necessarily ensure that it wasn't contaminated over here if the sampling wasn't done right. And so the ability to require um, a reliable third party to do that before it comes in is, is really a significant tool for us. Um, it also requires us to set up a voluntary program for importers that sort of go ab above and beyond to sort of give them a um, you know, a fast lane pass um, through the ports um, if they if they go above and beyond what we are requiring for the man what we call the mandatory program. Um, we also have a problem with um, sometimes we go over to a firm abroad and we go and inspect and they don't let us in and we've spent all this money getting our people over there. Um, so now we have the ability to deny entry at the border if they didn't um, if they didn't let us in over there. Um, and I think just essentially these provisions taken as a whole require it really s helps us. Um, ensure that the food that's coming in from abroad um, is as safe as that um, which is uh, produced domestically. Talked a little bit about 
um, partnerships. So I'm not going to go down all of these, but there are a couple that I would like to highlight because I think they might um, be of more interest to you. Um, one is um, reliance on inspections by other agencies, so we can rely uh, more on uh, inspections by state and local authorities um, and be able to use those that inspection data um, when um, we decide what to do about, about these com companies if there are problems. Um, there is a provision for state and local capacity building. We have to develop and implement strategies to leverage and enhance the food safety and defense capacities of state and local agencies, um, including information sharing and surveillance. Um, so those kinds of things where the states and the locals really are much closer to the situation than we are at the federal level, but that ability to, to set up those systems and, and uh, build that capacity is very useful for us because we don't want to duplicate what's already going on in the states. We really we want to leverage it. Um, surveillance, CDC, um, this is one that we don't do, but CDC has to enhance um, their surveillance systems to improve their data collection, um, analysis, and data sharing. Um, and, and also requires CDC to establish um, what's called in the act centers of excellence within state health departments to be the focal, ports, uh, focal point for federal, state, and local um, health professionals to respond once foodborne illnesses um, arise and outbreaks arise. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at the agency to implement this. I already talked a little bit about how we have to issue all of these regulations um, to sort of provide the, the details of these broad um, strokes of authority that, that we were given. Um, we're already pretty hard at work. We were talking about this earlier at the agency. Um, there are people who are almost around the clock trying to get some of these um, some of these regulations out. I talked a little bit. We have some experience with preventive controls in the areas of um, seafood, HACCP, hazard analysis, and critical control point um, systems, and juice. So we've already had a lot of experience in this area. And um, so that's really helpful as we move forward to, to write the broader preventive control regulations for the whole um, food supply. And we've also put in place sort of a streamlined process of review at the agency, um, which um, looking at Kevin out there because he was at the agency, but it's um, it's not always easy to, after you write uh, a regulation, get it cleared through the agency and through the Department of Health and Human Services and the White House. Um, so we've tried to put in place procedures that, that um, streamline that. Um, and we've already um, issued a number of, of some of the shorter term regulations on administrative detention. Um, and some other things. Um, we've also uh, there, there are also other things in the act that aren't regulations. Like there's now a more consumer friendly um, search engine for um, recalls that you can go on our website and look at. And so we've already we can already check a few boxes of things um, that we've already done. But um, there's an enormous workload ahead of us. Um, Fifty. This may not mean a lot to to many of you in the room, but to to produce 50 deliverables, including regulations and guidances and reports and search engines and IT fixes, um, is not easy for any um, for any federal agency. So um, we we not only have to do that, but oops, sorry, I'm turning the wrong page. We not only have to do that, but we have to do it. Um, in really sort of record time in the next year, one to three years, which sounds like a long time, but um, it's actually a rather short time in, in, the, uh, in the agency world because it takes a really long time to get these out. Um, but I think one of the main points I want to make is that a law is passed in January. The changes from this law, um, the, the improvements in food safety, um, the rules that we write, um, they take time. This is, this is a long-term project. This is not a quick fix. Um, we now have um, great new authorities, but it's going to take some time to, to implement them and to see those changes out in, in industry. Um, and a, a big challenge for us, as I mentioned before, is our resources. Um, we're in a very um, tight um, financial climate um, in the federal government, in all governments really. Um, so we are always being asked to do more um, with, at best, the same amount of resources and often um, fewer resources than we had before. So finding and dedicating the appropriate resources um, has, is a challenge for us. And it's caused us um, to, to look a little bit uh, differently at how we're going about doing things. We have um, been trying to work a lot with the, the regulated industry and consumer and public health groups reaching out in, 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 um, in settings like this and, and meetings, talking to people, getting their views, really um, um, a lot of transparency going on at the agency in terms of what we're doing um, and, and getting information outside the formal regulatory process. 
Um, and most importantly, um, we need to really find very practical and reasonable ways to implement this law because what's easy for a, a company, a big company like Kraft or General Mills is not so easy for smaller companies um, to do because they don't have the same resources and so we have to think when we're implementing these about the big guys who have all the labs and the scientific research and the third party auditors at their fingertips but also the little guys who don't, who still need to produce um, safe food but don't have the same kind of resources. So the goal is obviously to offer all of us is to protect public health um, but we need to do it in a way that's, that's reasonable and practical. Um, because we have so many deliverables and, and um, that are required of us, we've, we really um, had to sit and think through um, what are the ones that are going to give the biggest public health impact that we're going to focus on first because we can't, I think we've said very publicly, we can't meet all the deadlines in, in this act. So which ones are going to be the most important to us? Um, I've talked a little bit about them, preventive controls, produce standards, um, intentional contamination. The parentheticals next to them are the deadlines in, in the law, which might seem like a long time, but they're very short times and it will be a, a challenge to make those deadlines to a final rule. Um, with inspection, um, you can see where, where we'd like to put our resources and, and really um, in the import area to, to make sure that those rules that require importers to verify their supply chain and what they're bringing in is safe um, really um, is going to have to be one of our top priorities. Um, we will not make the one-year deadline to a final rule, um, but we're going to be working as, as fast as we can and try to do it in tandem with the mandatory um, preventive standards because that's really what they're verifying anyway. So. We really need to sort of do those two together. Um, so here, I've talked very fast and given you a lot of information. Um, these are some websites you can go to to learn a little bit more about what we're doing and um, a little bit more about the act. But I want to um, leave you sort of with a plea, which is um, that you um, here sitting in this room really can get involved in this. Um, um, we've had several public meetings around um, around the country, but certainly in, in our neck of the woods, um, in Washington, on some of these provisions. If you're particularly interested in them, you can attend the public hearings and listen in. You can even testify um, if, if, your, um, if your work um, can provide some, some information that we can use. Um, you can comment. I talked about a comment period for the, public, for, the, for the rules that we're issuing, so you can certainly read through the rules and provide any data um, or other comments that you have on the rules. And for those of you that work in a clinical setting, I think it's really important for you to really recognize when you see foodborne illness and report it um, to the right authorities. If you report it to the local authorities, it will get filtered in. Um, and that really sometimes isolating where the problem is and then um, is very difficult, but we can't react to it and, and stop it unless we know where it is. So if you are going into a clinical setting where you're going to be seeing um, some of the stuff, it's really important to remember um, to, to report those things. So I'm going to leave it, leave it there, um, turn it over to, to Keith, and let him talk a little bit about the science end of things. Um, thank you, Sharon. And uh, I just wanted to start off by thanking Molly Mitchell and the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to co-present with Sharon and, and uh, get a perspective from inside the agency of, of how implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act will happen. Um, I've got to switch to my presentation here. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to say that I, I don't think I would be comfortable calling myself an expert in the Food Safety Modernization Act, but it is a piece of legislation that since its passage uh, in the beginning of the year, it, it's something that uh, I and many other folks at the Center for a Livable Future have followed very closely. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how certain provisions in the FSMA overlap with some of our research interests and some of our hopes and concerns related to its implementation. So let me give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'd like to introduce you to the Center for a Livable Future and the Farming for the Future program, which I direct, uh, to give you some perspective on, on what parts of the FSMA apply to us. Um, I'd like to introduce the concept of industrial food animal production. And while Sharon has uh, already noted that the FSMA does not apply to meat products, I think there are ties that I will illustrate uh, between the production of food animals and produce safety that are really critical to the implementation of the FSMA. Uh, I'm going to talk 
quite extensively about animal waste and foodborne illness. Um, and I'll uh, look into the future and hopefully predict what we can discern about the potential impact of the FSMA on produce safety. And lastly, I'll talk about some budgetary concerns and implementation concerns of the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, so this is our conceptual framework for the Center for a Livable Future. I thought I'd just share with you our mission statement before I dive in. Um, the mission of the CLF is to promote research and develop and communicate information regarding the complex interrelationships between diet, food production, environment, and health in order to advance an ecological perspective on the protection and reduction of threats to human health. We aim to uh, advocate for policies that would protect humans, the global environment, and the ability of future generations to sustain life. So CLF is divided primarily into uh, two programs, my program, the Farming for the Future program, and the Eating for the Future program. And we like to think of the two sides of the house as the supply side, or the farming side, and the demand side, which is the eating side. So let me introduce you briefly to my uh, side of the house. Um, so our goal is to examine and characterize how food production impacts people and the environment. Uh, we have a wide spectrum of issues that we focus on in FFF. Um, I, I think much of our focus is, as I mentioned, on food animal production, both terrestrial and aquatic, but we are certainly interested in crop production, and there is a very close relationship between the production of animals and the production of food crops. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about antibiotic resistance as it relates to the use of antimicrobials in food animal production. Um, we also look extensively at drug residues, pesticide residues, and agriculture-related uh, occupational and rural health uh, rural community health issues. And uh, while much of our time is spent examining how agriculture maybe shouldn't be practiced, uh, we are expanding our horizons and we'd be remiss uh, to not consider how we should be doing things. So we're developing right now our uh, project within the, within the program to examine what some sustainable alternatives might be to our current agricultural system. Now, much of what we do, as I mentioned before, is not directly addressed by the Food Safety Modernization Act. And I, I've talked to a couple of folks who uh, were surprised to learn that uh, because FDA's mandate does not include meat products, that the FSMA does not directly address them. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that we're talking primarily today from our perspective about produce safety. Um, so Sharon did a really fantastic job going over uh, the point of the FSMA, but I thought I'd just briefly review a couple of key points. Um, so the, the FSMA authorizes some very critical changes to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the first of which deal with facilities. Uh, first and foremost, facilities are now required to register with the FDA and to keep records for up to two years uh, for the FDA's inspection if needed. Um, there is also the placement of mandatory preventive controls for those food production facilities, which is really critical. Um, the FSMA also addresses farms, which I'll talk a bit about in the future. Um, and, and there's an improved uh, approach to surveillance that allows for uh, interagency collaboration um, and improved food traceability. Uh, as Sharon mentioned a couple of times, the mandatory recall authority is, is now in place for the agency. And uh, I, I think it's, it's wonderful that there is a beefing up of some of the import controls, especially on seafood. Um, some folks in the FFF team just published a paper uh, looking at veterinary drug residues and imported seafood. And based on our comparison of the, of the US program for seafood imports as compared to some of the other governing bodies uh, around the world, um, there's room for improvement. Uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that that is on the agenda for the agency. Um, and this is another point Sharon uh, made, but I'd like to, to reiterate that um, the impact of some of these provisions uh, remains to be seen. The FDA has a huge, uh, a very full plate right now in implementing these regulations and really discerning what the impact of the regs will be uh, to some extent remains to be seen and, and is dependent on, on how the regulations look and, and how the resources that the agency has handed allow it to uh, write and enact the, reg the regs. So uh, the two pieces that I'll be talking about today are preventive controls for facilities and produce safety requirements. And we're not actually going to see the regs on these until the earliest June of 2012 um, and, and two th 2013 for the produce safety requirements. Um, so let me shift gears for a moment and talk very briefly about food animal production. So these are some statistics for uh, the various classes of food animals that we produce in the US, and these are statistics from 2009 to 2010. And I don't want to go through each of the animal classes, but the point I want you to pull away from this is that we produce about 9 billion food animals in the US each year, and we slaughter that many. Um, and it's important, considering how many of them we produce, uh, to examine what we're actually putting in their feed. And this will play into some of the issues I talk about in a little bit. Um, so 
we are feeding food animals uh, antibiotics, and, and not just to animals that are unhealthy. We are feeding uh, very healthy animals uh, routine low levels of uh, antimicrobials, and, and many of these antibiotics are the same drugs that we use to treat infections in humans. Um, and a recent analysis of FDA's data collected under the Animal Drug User Fee Act um, revealed that uh, nearly 80 percent of the antimicrobials or antibiotics consumed in the U.S. are fed to food animals, many of whom are healthy, uh, as compared to 20 percent uh, used in clinical medicine. So that's really key, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we're also feeding food animals our senical drugs, and uh, this is a practice uh, that the uh, manufacturer of many of these drugs in the U.S. has recently decided to stop selling these drugs, but historically this has been a concern and, and this continues to be a concern in food animal production overseas. Um, we are feeding food animals uh, byproducts of slaughtered and rendered animals. And what rendered animals are, an example of what that may be, would be if uh, an animal dies during the production process, it's actually taken out of the production process, ground up, and put back into animal feed, which some people may find revolting. Uh, we also feed food animals animal waste. Poultry waste is routinely uh, fed back to poultry and fed to cattle and swine as well. And lastly, uh, in some cases, in order to increase the mineral content of animal feed, uh, waste from certain industrial processes uh, will be added into animal feed. An example of this is uh, the processed waste from brass production. It's rich in zinc oxide, but unfortunately, it's also rich in dioxin and a variety of other heavy metals that have been demonstrated to be uh, of, of concern to humans and animals. Um, so based on what we feed food animals, we can anticipate, and, and this has been validated by a, a variety of, of uh, research, that uh, certain hazards will persist in animal waste. Um, I, I mentioned before that we're feeding 80% of the antimicrobials uh, consumed in the U.S. to food animals, and as a result, uh, we're seeing the emergence of bacteria that are resistant to drugs that are important in human medicine. And what that means is when a person uh, is infected with those bacteria, uh, the bacteria may not respond very well to an antibiotic therapy, uh, which means that those infections are very, very challenging to treat and in some cases are untreatable, and regardless of whether they're treatable or not, they are very, very expensive and often increase the time of a hospital stay for, a, for an infected person. So there are very, very grave public health concerns associated with the practice of, of administering uh, antibiotics to food animals. Uh, we also uh, have demonstrated in the literature that, that protozoa, fungus, fungi, and viruses can be present in animal waste and persist for some time. Uh, toxins from many of those microorganisms are present in animal waste as well as residues of drugs like the, the arsenical drug roxersone I mentioned before, um, heavy metals and other process-related chemicals, animal dander and nutrients. So many, many uh, wide spectrum of contaminants are available in animal waste for persons who might come into contact with it or for food products that may come into contact with it. So I mentioned before that we produce 9.1 billion food animals each year in the U.S. And to put that in perspective with regard to animal waste, I wanted to show you some data on what humans produce each year. So each year, people in the U.S. generate about 7 million dry tons of waste. And we apply a little more than half of that to agricultural land, and that sounds like a whole lot. But it's not nearly as much as animals generate. Animals generate nearly 300 million dry tons of waste each year, and we apply almost all of it to agricultural land. But one really critical difference between human waste and animal waste is that before we apply human waste to land, we treat it. We attempt to kill pathogens and remove some of the chemical contaminants. Now, it's debatable how effective those treatments are, but that's not really what I want to focus on today because animal waste largely is untreated before it's applied to land. In some cases, it's, it's uh, subjected to a limited amount of compost that research has shown isn't really effective in killing pathogens. So animal waste is loaded with a variety of contaminants that I mentioned on the previous slide that are there when it's managed. Um, so that's really key. And, and one fun fact I always like to share is that we generate about one uh, dry ton of animal waste per uh, person in the U.S. each year. So that, that's kind of stunning. Um, so I mentioned that we apply most of that animal waste to land, uh, and of course we're applying it mostly to agricultural land as a soil amendment. So because of its high nutrient or nitrogen and phosphorus content, uh, in the absence of those contaminants, it, it is a decent fertilizer. Um, but what happens is once that uh, animal waste is applied to land, and, and oftentimes it's over applied to land to the point where there's a lot of it available to uh, run off uh, horizontally or leach vertically into uh, surface and groundwaters during heavy rain events, um, 
there's certainly a chance for some of those contaminants to be mobilized and move elsewhere. Um, now, there are many instances where uh, some of the surface bodies of water and groundwater uh, that has been impacted by animal waste may be used to irrigate food crops. Um, and both the presence of the uh, soil amendment and the likely contamination of, uh, of irrigation water means that there's a potential for plants to accumulate um, a variety of chemical and microbiological contaminants that are present in food animal waste. Um, there's also the potential uh, for non-domesticated animals like uh, birds, wild hogs, rats, et cetera, to travel uh, between certain types of operations in, in, in rural settings. Um, a couple of research papers have demonstrated that, that wild hogs uh, can actually go between food animal production sites and carry bacteria that have been microbially traced back to those sites to other places where crops are produced. So that it's certainly another pathway uh, by which uh, some microorganisms can be transported between different types of operations. So there are certainly ways food animal waste uh, can can be uh, transported to food crops. And what that means is that people then uh, who come into contact with produce can be exposed to a variety of those contaminants, uh, including the pathogens and the chemicals. Now, one key point to, to make is that we're not solely talking about the surface of produce, although that certainly is of concern. Um, in many instances, chemicals can bioaccumulate within the produce that's being grown, so washing the surface of the, of the produce will do nothing uh, to minimize exposures to those contaminants. And in some cases, microorganisms can actually be incorporated into the tissues of the plants. So again, a, a wonderful example of this is sprouts, where microorganisms can actually uh, be trapped within the inside of the sprout. So short of irradiating the sprouts, there's really little that can be done uh, to minimize human exposure to those pathogens in the sprouts. So, um, we're not solely talking about surface-based risks. And absolutely, even though the Food Safety Modernization Act will not directly address this quite as much, um, there are issues related to exposures in, in workers in the food system, um, rural communities who surround uh, agricultural land and food animal production sites, and of course, uh, the consumers. So I wanted to shift gears now and talk a little more directly about the FSMA, and there are two provisions that I'd like to go through in a little bit of depth today. Um, the first is Section 103, which is processing facilities. Now, the FSMA authorizes some important changes um, that require these processing facilities to implement a hazard analysis and preventive controls. So the applicability of the FSMA uh, applies to facilities that manufacture, process, pack, um, manufacture, process, pack, and uh, hold food. Um, it requires a multi-contaminant hazard assessment and analyses for, for vulnerabilities and risks to the facilities. Um, and it covers uh, microbiological, chemical, uh, radiological, and physical hazards. Um, everything from drug residues to bacterial toxins to uh, process-related chemicals. Um, it also requires preventive controls uh, to, be, to be implemented on the part of the facility operator that address many of the vulnerabilities identified during the hazard analyses. Um, and again, that burden is borne by the facility operators, and it, it really remains to be seen how the regs will, will ensure that. But I, I think that's a really positive development. Um, they're, they're also, in addition to implementing those preventive controls, it requires that facility operators be uh, better stewards of their facilities uh, re by requiring monitoring, corrective action, verification, record keeping. I mentioned that uh, records need to be kept for inspection by the FDA for up to two years and reanalysis based on changes to the preventive controls. There are some important exemptions to the FSMA uh, that are of some concern to us. Uh, certainly um, ju fruit juices, uh, seafood, um, canned foods and businesses uh, earning less than half a million dollars in profits each year. So I wanted to give a quick example of a recent outbreak and talk about how uh, some of the preventive measures uh, for facilities may address that. So um, some of you may be familiar with the recent Salmonella typhimurium outbreak in peanut butter. And uh, some of the news reports have reported uh, that the origin of the outbreak was a facility um, called the, uh, owned by the Peanut Corporation of America in Blakely, Georgia. <laughs> Um, and, and wild bird droppings on the roof of the facility have been implicated uh, in, in the resulting contamination in the peanut butter that was then spread and caused over 700 infections and up to nine deaths almost in every state across the U.S. Um, and what, what can be learned from the changes that are being proposed to the FSMA is that a, a hazard analysis and appropriate preventive controls may have identified flaws in biosecurity of the processing facility that may have uh, made an outbreak like this far less likely. Um, now let me talk about the other provision that's of key interest to us, and these are the standards for produce safety. This really addresses some of the on-farm issues 
uh, we're, we're, not, we're very happy to see the language of science-based minimum standards um, in the statute uh, that are intended to minimize the risks. Um, and, and again, it, the statute actually specifies a, a multi-contaminant uh, approach that, that is encompassing of biological concerns, uh, chemical concerns, radiological concerns, and physical concerns of hazards that can be introduced into fruits and vegetables at the farm site. Um, and the standards are required to address a variety of inputs into produce production uh, that I think uh, makes me very hopeful about how the, how the actual regulation will roll out. And these encompass everything from soil amendments, water, hygiene, packing, temperature controls, and as I mentioned before, the potential uh, for animals, uh, usually non-domesticated animals, who may spend time in the growing area and carry contamination from elsewhere. And lastly, uh, based on uh, precedent and prior outbreaks, um, the FSMA calls for a risk-based prioritization of produce items, which I think is really key. Um, so let me give you another example of a, of a prior outbreak that might be addressed by uh, the FSMA. So in 2006, I think many of us may remember the E. coli 0157H7 outbreak in fresh spinach. I remember being disappointed that I wasn't able to find spinach in grocery stores. It's one of my favorite foods. Um, but it turns out that the production site or the farm uh, where the spinach was being raised was in very close proximity uh, to a, a cattle facility, a, 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 cat, a feedlot. And uh, it turns out that uh, some of the the E. coli that was isolated from the spinach was actually microbiologically indistinguishable um, from E. coli that was found in the animal waste. And it was never determined definitively um, how the E. coli was transported from the cattle waste to the spinach, um, but some of the epidemiologi epidemiologists and microbio um, microbiologists working for the CDC had said that it's unlikely that um, a worker was capable of infecting enough spinach to actually lead to the outbreak of this magnitude, and that it was more likely that uh, the animal waste in some way was either transported horizontally by a rain event, or the close proximity of the spinach farm to the cattle production site may have been responsible for carrying of the bugs, uh, uh, the microorganisms from the waste to the spinach. So the important point here is that uh, a consideration of the inputs uh, to the produce production process um, from a risk perspective may allow for a, a recognition of, of the hazards that exist and preventive measures that would likely uh, reduce the contamination of, of the raw product that could then uh, lead to infections in consumers. So taking a step back and assessing the FSMA, I think Sharon did a nice job uh, laying out the burden of disease related to foodborne outbreaks. Um, but I just wanted to add to that, in you know, the past five years, CDC has identified 43 multi-state outbreaks. So this is not a, uh, a, a minuscule problem. This is a problem of significant uh, public health concern. Um, and the FSMA, uh, based on what we can tell from the legislation, is a good first step towards preventing some of these outbreaks. Although, of course, it really depends on, on the nature and the rollout of the regulations and the resources afforded to the agency to actually um, implement those regulations. Um, and, and still, I, I mentioned this before, there are certain, uh, certain media, certain foods that are, are uh, in the U.S. food supply that are not covered by the FSMA, and uh, it, it would be prudent to uh, investigate uh, policy mechanisms to enact legislation that may allow for the protection of those foods. Uh, and certainly, changes to animal feeds and drugs used in food animal production will impact uh, both uh, meat safety and produce safety. Um, I just wanted to close by talking quickly about the FSMA and the FDA budget. Um, so, of course, uh, implementing regulation requires uh, resources. And I think many of us are well aware of the current political climate and uh, how tough it is to be a, a federal regulatory agency right now. Um, the FDA has published an estimate of, of the resources it needs um, for the fiscal year 2012 uh, implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act, and that estimate's about $183 million. And uh, recently, we've seen uh, the House and Senate issue uh, there are versions of bills that would appropriate money for the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and the Senate bill looks a little more promising. Uh, they have increased FDA's budget over uh, fiscal year 2011 by about $50 million, which wouldn't quite get us to $183 million. Uh, but the House bill takes things in quite the other direction, uh, and they're proposing to cut the FDA's budget by $300 million. Now, these uh, increases or cuts don't necessarily correspond solely to the Food Safety Modernization Act, but playing with an agency's resources is certainly going to have an impact on, on um, pending regulation. So uh, 
we're hopeful that the way the budget works out won't have too big of an impact on the agency, but we are certainly concerned. So a couple of quick conclusions. The way we produce food animals creates risks not only for uh, the, the meats uh, themselves, but also surrounding communities and, and produce safety. Um, and we're really excited about the preventive focus of the Food Safety Modernization Act, and we'll be paying close attention to FDA's writing of those regs and implementation of those regs. Um, I think there's a lot that can be learned from the past five years and, and 43 foodborne outbreaks um, that can help the agency prioritize and strategize with its implementation of the regulations. And lastly, the political climate is inevitably going to have an impact on FDA's ability to write the regs and implement them. So uh, that's something we'll be paying close attention to as well. Um, and that's all I have, so thanks very much. Um, thank you both very much. Um, at this point in the presentation, we are now open to taking questions, both from our live audience and for those watching online. And just a reminder, if you are watching online, simply find the link on your screen to click and uh, email us in a question. So um, why don't we go ahead and start uh, with the folks in the room. Does anyone have a question for either of our presenters today? Yeah, and um, is Janie here for the microphone? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. There was someone in the back. We're just, if you can wait till we get you a mic so everybody online can hear your question. So this, this may be too detailed a political question, but um, I mean, when I say the House bill would uh, reduce FDA resources, is that um, specifically pointing at anything that uh, you might want to know about and advocate to protect, or is it just sort of a general? This far, can you hear me? That mic should be on. Hello? Oh. <laughs> um, as far as I'm aware, it's a general cut to the agency's budget, and it's not targeted towards minimizing funds for the FSMA. So I, I think it's a non-specific cut across the board for the agency. Okay. Any highlights about the uh, application of new technology from this uh, new uh, modernization act? Thank you. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there is definitely going to be a focus. I can go a little bit beyond the act at the agency for looking at um, new technology in terms of rapid test methodologies that are that we're looking to enact, um, looking toward maybe more partnerships with industry who might be developing these things and have the money to develop some of these tools um, in those areas. So that's certainly that's certainly one thing we're looking at. It when when I think technology, I also think of course of um, IT type of uh, technology, and and that's um, a big issue with this act, as many of the components have significant IT. Um, but I, that's probably not where you're going with that, but have signif uh, significant IT um, enhancements that would be needed to, to do that. But I think um, there's nothing really, th there are some um, areas in the act that talk about collaboration with research, but there's no, there's no direct either uh, mandate or funding um, for that kind of thing. I don't know if you have any. Okay. I have another question about uh, the food safety on, uh, on the seafood. Can you give a little bit of details about the seafood on the um, new, new, new act? Sure. Um, I think you've talked about how seafood was exempted from the preventive um, controls reg, which on its face appears, um, appears alarming considering that we have a lot of issues with seafood. But one of the reasons that it was exempted was because, um, and I, I think it was nine, 1994, um, I'm trying to remember the year, um, we put in place, carved out from our old authority, um, something called HACCP for seafood, which is hazard analysis, uh, critical control point, which is essentially what this act is mandating for the entire food supply. So one of the reasons that it was carved out of the preventive controls rules, because I think it was, um, it was Congress's intent to, to sort of stick with what we have, which is very similar. I think as we move ahead in implementing the preventive controls rules, it's causing us to take a look back at our seafood rules to see if there might not be some additional changes we might need to make to them, given that it's been, you know, a decade or so, um, or almost two decades, and to, 
that we've issued those. So I think um, while it's not a direct mandate of, of the act or while they've been exempted, I think at a consequence of what we do in, in across the broader uh, food supply um, will be that we'll take a look back at our seafood hassle regs to see if there's any tweaking um, that needs to happen. One thing in the act um, that I, I didn't mention was that we were required to issue a seafood hazards guide, um, which we do periodically. We try to update it, which is, um, I talked a little bit about guidance documents. It's a non-binding document that we issue to sort of help seafood processors figure out where their hazards are and how to, to control them. So certain species of fish, I'm not an expert in this area, have, have um, different kinds of, of hazards, whether they're toxins or bacterial hazards um, that arise. And so this guide that we issue called the Seafood Hazards Guide, which we just issued in April, the most updated version, which was mandated by the Act, um, we, we have met that deadline and we have issued that and we tend to do that. Um, so that's an example of some place where, you know, especially for small businesses who really, you know, ha have no, um, don't have a lot of experience in the area of preventive controls. The Act not only requires us to issue these regulations, but there are several companion guidances that we'll be issuing to sort of help bring that segment of the industry along and, and hopefully um, be written um, in conjunction and in, with cooperation and the input of those in industry who sort of are light years ahead of that and who are, um, are already implementing a lot of these controls. So I think we'll be seeing more of those types of guides issued by the agency. Um, you talked a lot about uh, prevention of contamination with the, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Modernization Act. Um, but if contamination does happen, is it, what is there in the act that's going to prevent uh, people getting sick from being the first indication that there was contamination? I don't know. Um, you, you mentioned surveillance. Could you go a little bit more specifically into that? Um. Sure. That's that's actually not one of our mandates. Most of the most of the things in this act are for FDA to do. That's one where we'll be working with CDC, and CDC has the lead. But certainly, there is an emphasis. I think there is a recognition in the act that, you know, no matter how good what we have um, is um, in place and what the requirements are, um, there are going to be issues with the food supply, whether it's people not complying at all with them, or whether things just um, slip through, or whether birds fly across fields, and those kinds of things are really hard to control. So. One of the things, um, there are several things in the act that, um, that will help us I don't, I, in terms of increasing our inspection of these facilities to make sure, and that's one of the areas where funding is, is sort of critical. We can write the best regulations in the world um, that could prevent you know, a significant portion of these illnesses. But if people aren't following the regulations, um, they're not really much uh, worth much more than the paper that they're printed on. So our ability or third party's ability to get into these facilities and make sure, or, the, or on the farm in the case of produce, to make sure that, that there is compliance with the regulations is significant. There are also a number of enforcement tools, which um, I mentioned briefly, in addition to inspections, things like um, um, our ability to administratively detain a product. So it used to be if there was a problem with a product, we have to build a case um, through our chief counsel's office and they would have to go to court and argue or else we would just ask the state who has different authorities to seize the product and, and, um, and or administratively detain the product. So this gives us an ability to act more quickly um, in terms of seizing products um, or detaining products without a court order, the ability to recall products. Um, so there are some additional enforcement tools which we didn't have before. Um, which we will have that still um, should help us react. But in terms of surveillance, I also talked a little bit about the Centers for Excellence, the ability of CDC to build up their surveillance, um, because, because you're right. I mean, it really, um, from, from our perspective, when we start seeing these clusters of illnesses, um, they're very hard to piece together. And even once you identify um, you know, the vehicle, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the actual microorganism, for instance, that might be making people sick, trying to get people to remember what they ate you know, yesterday versus maybe days ago or a week ago before they actually went to the doctor and said, hey, maybe this is more than a bug, um, is really difficult. I've had, you know, experience with this, you know, personally with friends who have, you know, figured out like a week later that, oh, yeah, we did all eat that chicken at that party and, you know, trying to, uh, was, uh, you know, trying to figure that out. So um, I think that we really need to work on that. It's not only um, sort of figuring out what the exact, um, problem is that's causing it, but then figuring out what the vehicle, the food vehicle is. Um, and that's it's something that really needs to get built up. There is some, um, there are some um, pieces in the legislation that um, is really working with the states and the locals, because as I said, they're really closer to it. We're not going to get the reports. We don't generally, we do get reports on, 
On, uh, we have something called a reportable food registry, um, where registered facilities have to report if there are problems. But in general, it's it's the practitioners that are seeing this, and so you know, getting them to, to report the data, getting it collated, sharing that data, you know, across states. You said 43, you know, 43 multi-state outbreaks. I mean, how, you know, someone, the way that the food supply works now is so different than it was 100 years ago when you were buying things at a local market and you weren't getting spinach from California and cookies from Chicago and, um, you know, wherever it is. The ability to sort of, tr to, to produce and transport food over long distances makes that challenge. Um, really great for us, and and I think that you're right in in bringing that up. That it's something we need to work on. Um, is there another question here? Yeah, hi. Um, it seems that the success of the act of protecting public health is really dependent on the ability of the FDA to set good standards, and um, that those standards, as, as sort of Keith gave us a lot of examples of how there's a lot of factors that go into setting those standards and things that need to be looked at. And we've seen, and I'm worried that uh, with the sort of time frame you have and the uh, resources you have, the ability to set standards based on modern science, which is sort of the things that Keith was talking about, really are based on, on very new science. And we've seen a, from history that the FDA has been very slow to adopt science. For example, it took them 60 years to do a study to look at Roxer Zone in a new way. Or uh, we're looking right now at uh, levels of arsenic and apple juice, we see that the standards set for that are based on science is over 20 years old. So how is uh, FDA going to avoid taking shortcuts in the rush to set these standards? Well, I mean, you know, we have to, um, we have to deal with the science as it, is, as it is ex exists right now. So um, we have obviously a lot of experts at the agency in these areas. Um, the whole notice and comment <coughs> rulemaking process is something where we, First of all, we've done something and uh, really unprecedented with this um, with this rule is that we've opened up dockets in all of those major areas I talked about preventive controls and imports and inspections and compliance um, prior to even issuing our proposed rule. Usually, what we do is we get you know we get our best scientists together, we propose something, we get comments from scientists you know all around the world, and we we come up with a final rule. Um, we've really reached out in this instance to try to get some of those comments and that input prior to even issuing the proposed rule. So we really have made um, a really an unprecedented effort in this, with this particular law um, to reach out. Um, that said, you are correct. It is a short time period. And, but I think the most important point is that science changes. Um, it changes all the time. And so whatever we do in our rules has to be something that, that can be fluid. And one of the requirements, for instance, of a preventive control, a food safety plan that, a, that, a, um, that we're going to require, I mean, we're not going to write food safety plans for you know millions of products that are being produced what we're going to do is we're going to tell companies you know sort of what the criteria are for a food safety plan and one of those has to be and I think that you touched on it is a re-examination um, a periodic re-examination as to whether whatever you've developed in 2013 or whenever you actually have to d start using these plans is working in 2014 or 2015. I think that the bigger companies do this on a you know, consistent basis anyway, um, because they have a lot at stake in producing safe food. If you have a, a problem with a brand name, um, you know you're not you're going to be reluctant to buy that brand name again. So you know they're very careful about protecting even if, even if uh, I think they're concerned about public health, but also just from a business perspective, they need to make sure that um, that what they're producing is safe. And and everybody has an interest in producing safe food. I don't mean to to imply any anything else. But I think that when we write the regs, we have to think about that science changes and that there has to be a burden on industry to reevaluate what they're doing. It, they're, the regulations, the goal of the regulations is not to be so prescriptive as to sort of capture this moment in time, but it's more to put it back on the industry to say, you know, you, this is your, your burden to figure out how best to, what the hazards are and how best to control them, and you're going to need to keep re-examining it and monitoring them to make sure that they're working and to make sure that the science hasn't changed. If there's a new rapid test method that gets developed for something, that might become the state of the art and something that we expect all companies to do, but we can't predict where that science is going in the future. Okay, we um, have a number of questions from our online audience, so I'd like to get a few of those in first um, before we get to more from our live audience. Um, and this one is probably for Sharon. Um, is there anything in this legislation that requires a country of origin to be on the food label? For example, Canada is allowed to label food assembled in Canada without identifying if foods or ingredients come from other countries. Will that change? 
You know, that's always a, a, a sort of a, a controversial issue. There is something um, actually in one of the ag bills um, that requires country of origin to be labeled, for instance, for um, actually for seafood, which is one of our products. But um, the thing about country of origin is that it's it's sort of difficult because, for instance, um, you know, sugar and spices. I mean, think about how many ingredients. Uh, if any of you have any food in front of you, looking to go and look at the ingredient list. Most of our spices are not grown in the United States, so. You know, where does a product come from? It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a conglomeration of so many different ingredients from so many different places that it becomes sort of difficult to sort of figure out, you know, are you talking about where it was actually sort of put together and packaged, or are you talking about the ingredients um, that come in? I mean, I think the point of this law is that no matter where the ingredients come from, um, they need to be safe. And so if you're making cookies in, in Chicago, I just happened to have been at a cookie plant in Chicago last week, so it's on my mind watching Oreos being made. Um, so you, it, it, you know, it's your obligation to make sure that your incoming ingredients, whether you're a facility producing the food or an importer bringing something in, um, you, know, you need to make sure that that's safe. It doesn't matter what country it, it comes from um, because you know, Peanut Corporation of America, that was, um, the, that was a company right here in the United States. Would it have mattered if it said made in the United States because people got sick from that product? So I think the important thing to focus on is really the safety of the ingredients and the safety of the final product and less, um, less so much on where those ingredients come from. But if the obligation is there to make sure that all income ingredients, no matter where they come from, is safe, then um, I think that takes care of a lot of the problem. And um, this, may term, this may depend on how the regulations come out, but the question is um, that you both mentioned that facilities would be required to keep records for two years for inspection and wondering if there is a requirement for facilities to send an alert to the FDA or regulatory agency when sampling or testing results are positive for pathogens. Um, there is something called the reportable food registry requirement, which requires registered facilities um, to, to notify us of, of um, foods. I think um, you know, the tricky thing is that's really food that, if there's a problem with sampling and it's, and it's taken care of, um, it's sort of tricky. At what point do you notify the, the, the FDA? If, if it's a company that notices that there's a problem with a food and destroys all the food and cleans the lines and takes care of it so it never leaves the facility, um, you know, that's a very different issue than having a product, a finished product that, that they've had a problem with and maybe they've had a complaint, a consumer complaint come back to them. So there is an obligation of a facility to report back to us when um, foods, when consumers have been exposed um, to foods or where they have a reasonable belief that the food um, could make people sick, but there is no obligation to report, um, you know, for instance, you know, if you tested listeria, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all over the place and uh, it's a matter of how you control it. Um, so I think it, it's really a matter of at what point do they have to report to us that it poses a risk to public health. And that's where the requirement triggers for these facilities. Okay. This is a little long, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that through. Um, previously, FDA did not have the same approval process as USDA had. FDA was only able to approve food and food additive imports at the port of entry through limited inspections at the borders. FDA was not allowed to inspect facilities or processes in other countries prior to export from that country unless it was doing traceback investigation of a foodborne illness outbreak, etc. FDA complained this is why we had trouble with melamine and lead in food products, etc., and wanted more control with approval prior to export. I'm wondering if this legislation changes FDA's approval process and allows them to inspect facilities in other countries prior to export to be consistent with USDA. Okay, um, USDA has a very different system. Um, in, in the area of imports than FDA does. Um, first of all, you can't, you, and, it's, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a product of the underlying law. So first of all, let me start by saying no. Um, the answer to that question, I believe, <laughs> is no. Um, and here's why. Um, under USDA's law, um, you can't export a meat or poultry product, a domesticated meat and poultry product. There is a little quirk in the law that we get some of the undomesticated things like ostrich and emu um, that we do register some, some uh, we do re uh, regulate game meats actually, um, some game meats. But, um, but when you think about meat and poultry products that most people eat, that you can't export it to the United States unless your system has been um, determined to be equivalent to that of the United States, and then even after that, it's subject to inspection as it comes across um, the border. Um, FDA's um, system is, is quite different from that. Um, first of all, let me just say that the number of products that we actually, um, that are imported, that are FDA products, is, is you know, um, much more numerous than, than the products that um, USDA has. They have a much more limited, you know, you're talking about meat and poultry, we're talking about 
everything else in the food supply. And, and when you go to other countries, you know, every, every single product could be regulated differently. So determining equivalence um, of each product the way that, that USDA does would, would be quite um, sort of untenable um, for, for us. But, I will, but, but that said, I will say that there are significant changes to our authorities in the import area that I think will have a, a, a tremendous difference in the safety of the food um, that comes across. And I, I talked about a few of them. Um, number one is that, um, and that we, we actually have always, we, we don't, the only authority we have to really inspect overseas is, is really based on the government's ability to let us into the country and the facility's ability to get in there. We, can, we can't get a court order in the United States and s demand to be let in. But one of the triggers that I talked about briefly was if they don't let us into their facility when we inspect, we can automatically say they can't come into the United States. And that's a pretty potent tool. It's, it's, it seems small, but if, but it's, there's sort of a presumption that there's going to be a problem if they're not letting us into the plant. So that gives us sort of this, this lock um, at our border that we can have for certain facilities. That said, you know, we're not going over and inspecting 200,000 facilities, so that's not going to always be the case. So then it, you, you go down to sort of the responsibility of the importer. Um, and as I mentioned, it was, that is a significant change in our authorities because if you're in, you can no longer just import food um, without taking some responsibility for its safety. And we do have jurisdiction over the importers because the importers are actually in the United States. And so you as an importer, if you want to import some food product that's regulated by FDA, now have a mandatory obligation or will after we issue our regulations to ensure that that product was produced under preventive controls that are at least that will provide public health protection um, that is at least the same as those provided, um, that, those for domestic facilities. Um, so, so it's sort of, you know, I don't want to use the term equivalence because it's not equivalence, but it requires um, sort of a, a sa the same level of health, public health protection for imported foods that it does. And it becomes the importer's obliga uh, obligation and responsibility um, to help us ensure that, that that's the case. We'll still be over there. We'll still be inspecting. Um, we will still be um, relying on some third parties in some cases to do those inspections, but the importer is, is sort of going to be um, held responsible for that. So that is a significant change. It isn't what USDA has. Um, the, I, we also come through, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but you know, there are many, many ports that everything comes through too. So that's it's much more limited with USDA where what, what ports um, meat and poultry can come in, where you, know, you can FedEx you know, uh, food into anywhere and airports and you know e everything. So we have a lot of um, a lot of different um, sort of historical differences in our statutes. Okay. Um, yeah, over here. Hi, could you maybe shed some light on the way that this new the FSMA is going to impact the small local pr producers? It sounds like um, it's being designed to address the large producers, but it's not clear how these obligations are going to impact uh, people who are producing food and selling it locally and what challenges they might face in terms of meeting the, these new requirements. Um, Congress has um, written in, there was something referred to as the Tester Amendment, um, and because it was introduced um, by, by Tester, but um, it, it exempts facilities whose gross sales are less than $500,000 um, a year. That's not something we have any um, discretion over. That was something that Congress um, said had to be exempted. Um, so, um, so that's one thing, and that's both in the facility area and in the produce area. In produce, there's also a, a requirement that it be within a certain geographical location, so the intent was to exempt people that are sort of growing and just selling locally. It raises some interesting issues when you're talking about sort of Texas and Mexico or Cuba and Florida, because I think they might fall within the geographic area that was meant to sort of mean domestic production and sort of small farms. But those um, exemptions were carved out by, um, by Congress, and so we really can't we don't have any discretion in that area. Um, but with respect to um, the many small producers, which will still be considered small, um, that might not be exempted, um, there is a great deal of outreach to, to that community um, and uh, to help uh, make them understand the obligations under the law. There's also some, like I, I talked before about guidance documents that we'll be producing to help them understand what hazards might apply in particular areas, maybe in particular areas of produce, or um, like I said, we have a big seafood guide that helps them um, comply. I mean, it's certainly, um, it's certainly our hope that some of the smaller guys will, 
people want to comply voluntarily, but under the law, we don't have any authority to, to, do, to require that. So the exemption means that they won't have to fill out any paperwork? No, well, I should, I should clarify that. They are exempt from the, they will be exempt from the regulations, but they do have, and I don't have my statute in front of me, um, but, but they do actually do have an obligation to be licensed and to follow state and local requirements and produce, essentially produce, produce safe food but at least in the area of, of facilities, and I, I remiss in not sort of highlighting that, they do they have obligations under the statute, but they won't have to follow the letter of whatever regulations we produced. So it's not as if they're sort of off the hook and can do whatever they want. Um, but but the burden will be less on them because they won't have to follow um, the more detailed regulations that were going to be issued. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, from from what you presented, it sounds like food safety requires a lot of collaboration and communication between different agencies within the United States and, and from abroad as well. I was I was wondering if, uh, whether the FSMA uh, allows for further funding or regulation or guidance in terms of uh, better collaboration between agencies. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the la funding or guidance for what? Better collaboration between the CDC, the FDA, the uh, department, the and foreign agencies, similar foreign agencies. Sure, there's actually a lot in, in the act um, about cooperation with other agencies. Um, from a, an inspection standpoint, um, the act explicitly says that we can rely on the inspections of state and local authorities. So if they're in looking at a facility, we can share that data. Um, there's a, um, a lot in terms of um, labs, um, sharing, sharing um, lab capacity. Um, and not build, building it and then and sharing it among agencies so that we're not duplicating efforts of each other. So there's there's a lot in there about um, developing plans with other agencies, for instance, in the, deep, the food defense area, um, you know, working with USDA to develop a plan in the food defense area. Um, so there, there's a lot in there. I don't have my complete list in front of me about working with other agencies. Um, in foreign, um, for foreign governments too, in addition, um, First of all, there's there's a mandate in there that we that we continue to establish um, our foreign offices. Um, it's only fairly recently that FDA has started establishing offices in China, in India, um, in in Latin America, in Europe, um, really all over, with with the hope that we can build relationships both with the foreign governments and also provide technical assistance to some of those facilities that are abroad. Um, th those relationships and the function of those offices is is still very much developing. Um, but there are also several places um, in the Act where uh, there is an encouragement of, of sort of sharing the inspectional resources of, um, of other countries as well. And in fact, in um, July, um, the agency issued a globalization report that I was a part of, sort of separate from, from the, the FISMA work that I do, um, which really talked about how, you know, in, in this very global environment that we live in, um, in 2011, that, that the government, all of our, the regulatory regimes that are fairly sophisticated need to be working together um, to share a lot more data. There's nothing in the act that says we can actually rely on inspections from other countries, but I think as we share more and more data with countries, um, you know, like New Zealand and the EU and Canada who, who have fairly sophisticated regulatory systems, we will be making decisions on where we put our resources based upon some of the information um, that we share. So, so, so the the, um, the goal really is for more sharing with foreign governments as well, um, helping each other. Um, we certainly do come together when there's a crisis, um, and there's you know we've had a lot of cooperation um, with foreign governments when there's an outbreak. Um, but the idea is not to is to do that before then, um, so that we in our in like I keep saying we're not going to get to 200 foreign facilities. Well, where do we go? We need to make decisions, strategic risk-based decisions on where we're going to go to look at these facilities. So if we know that um, you know a government that has a sophisticated um, uh, regulatory regime is already looking at those facilities, maybe that's not where maybe that's not where we go. Maybe we go to some other country that has a less sophisticated or where there's, there, we've had um, problems in the past and we put our resources there. So th there's actually a lot in the act um, with respect to partnerships and leveraging. Thanks for your great talks. Um, just a brief follow-up comment kind of on both questions. There's also a piece of the act that 
designates a small amount of money toward the USDA, so the Department of Agriculture, to establish training for small and mid-sized farmers so that they know how to comply with these um, regulations. And there's some risk that the funding, given the funding situation, that the funding for that piece may not come through. So if you're concerned about this sort of issue, that's one little piece that you can push your representatives to pay attention to. Yeah, that's a really good point. There are, um, I think, one or two provisions that deal with grants, but grants are dependent on funding, as you say. I had a question for Keith um, about your um, about the larger problem about animal waste and that not uh, not having treatment for it. Is there, are there any best practices or interventions we're being pointed at at this stage? Or I, I'm getting the feeling that the, at this stage we're more in the, sort of characterizing the problem. But, uh, but maybe I'm missing uh, some interventions that uh, we should be pointing at. I, I, I can't say that I, I stand behind any of the in interventions as gold standards or, or, or ways forward. I, I think we at the CLF are, are advocating in uh, reduction and concentration of animal production. I, I think that does less to deal with the waste itself, but at least it distributes the waste, uh, I think, across a wider geographical area and maybe reduces the likelihood of over-applying and creating issues with runoff, creating issues with leaching into groundwater. Um, composting has been advocated for in a, in a variety of settings, but as I mentioned, uh, composting doesn't kill all of the bugs that are present in the waste. And there are a variety of other uh, storage and, and treatment mechanisms that have been proposed, but, but the literature really doesn't support their effectiveness. So. I, I wish I had a better answer, uh, an easy way forward, but by generating that much animal waste, there really aren't a lot of options for how to ensure its safety before using it as fertilizer. Okay. Um, we did have a, another question online, um, and this is asking about grocery retailers and how this law may impact them. Um, and how will it impact grocery retailers in terms of perishables, produce, seafood, et cetera? And then the second part of the question is, how does this impact grocery retailers who provide private label foods in the packaged and prepared foods arenas, if at all? Well, I would say that a lot of um, retailers are also importers. Um, so, you know, retailers, I always, I always think of Costco because I, I, I always think they have such a good, uh, um, this isn't a plug for Costco, but I've gotten calls, <laughs> <laughs> calls that, you know, when their things have been recalled that they've actually, Call, I've gotten phone calls from them that says, you know, don't eat that, <laughs> um, which hopefully I would have known before they called me, but um, <laughs> given my position, but I have to admit, <laughs> there's been one or two that, um, that were not our products that I, that I might have missed in the news. Um, so I think a lot of the retailers are also importers. If they're not registered facilities um, that, that prepare, pack, hold, you know, hold food in the sense that as it's defined under the Act, then they're not sort of, they don't, if they're not processing the food, then they're not under the, the processing, the preventive controls rules. But because so many of them are importing foods, they will be responsible for um, ensuring that the food that they import um, meets um, US standards or uh, offers the same level of protection. So I think that's where, where you get it. So, and it's interesting, in fact, that the, a lot of the retail facilities have really been at the forefront, um, first of all, of third party audits. Um, you can bet that um, you know, Costco, Walmart, all the big chains, um, don't import um, food unless, um, unless they have auditors out there. Um, what we've heard from them is they've really been at the cutting edge and the driving force of this a reliable third-party system that they can get out there. And, um, and so I think that they really, have, um, they really have been sort of ahead of us um, on that curve. So I think that they have, a lot of them have taken responsibility, but to the extent that they're also importers for food, or um, then they would also have to have those controls in place. And as I said, I think that um, well, I don't want to go too much into the third-party system, but a lot of companies already use these third-party systems. And so what you get is this facility who's being inspected by, you know, 16 different auditors in a month because Costco and Walmart and Giant and, you know, Nabisco, and they're all sending their auditors, their auditors in to look at this one facility. And so the hope with this legislation is that it's really going to sort of drive innovation in a way where it'll be the facility abroad that sort of gets an audit that's acceptable to everybody. Um, because what we hear is that the, it's very disruptive for these facilities to have 16 auditors in a month sort of go through their facility. It, it disrupts their business practices. And so I think the ultimate sort of long-range goal, is, as we see it, is, is having 
a system where a lot of these facilities, um, certainly abroad, and I think even domestically, although not it's it's not covered by the third party provision of this act, will be in a position where they're getting these these audits that are acceptable to all of their customers. And I think I think we're going to see a drive in that direction just for efficiency purposes in the market. And I think that this act sort of gives us those tools to to help um, to help push it that way. Um, so that's what I that's what I'll say about retailers. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more. Okay. I'm kind of, uh, back to your response to my question from before, I'm kind of concerned about the way you answered it and the philosophy underlying that uh, industry should set standards for itself and be reviewing science and resetting standards because we've seen certainly in food animal production that industry is doing lots of things to promote the development of resistant bacteria that threatens public health and there's lots of evidence that they're doing this and they refute it. We see uh, with Roxer Zone, there was lots of evidence that it's dangerous to public health. And it wasn't until FDA actually stepped in and did a study that Pfizer pulled it from the market. So how can you get companies, or what will we do to get them to actually live up to this belief you have that they can regulate themselves? Well, I don't want to give the impression that we're, they're letting companies regulate themselves. So you've sort of, there's a few different things in your question. So when it comes to things like drugs that are being fed animals, they're under a much more regulated regime. And you're right, there are, there are issues with some of them. And new science comes up, and, and it has to be presented. But in terms of sort of the, the preventive control standards, it's, it's, we're not in a position as an agency to say, OK, you're making you know, x, y, and z products, and we're going to tell you every hazard um, you know, and how to produce that product safely. I mean, ultimately, the, 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 the emphasis on this, of this legislation is that it, it has to be industry's responsibility and should always have been industry's responsibility to produce safe foods. That doesn't mean that there's not regulatory oversight, um, that we're not going to be in there looking at their food safety plans. But we, it would be very difficult for the agency to, for every single food product, to say, okay, here's the hazard. And I'm not actually sure you'd want a, a, a system where we're saying, okay, it's this product, and these are the hazards, and this is how you control this particular hazard. I think that our guidance documents that we put out there will go a long way toward that. But as you were saying before, science changes. And this may be the best way to control this hazard you know, in 2013 when these rules come out. But in 2014, there may be some new scientific method that eliminates it completely, not just reduces it by 90%. So do we really want to write into a regulation, which I can assure you will take years to change, um, that they have to, they have to meet you know, the 2013 standard, when the 2014 science has already surpassed what we, what we could have said. And so the idea when we write regulations, and, and you're right, it's a very tricky, you know, it's, it's a fine line. We have to sort of figure out where the line is, where we, where we put the responsibility on the industry with obviously oversight by FDA to make sure they're meeting that facility, but you can't lock science into, um, into the regulations because science is constantly changing. And what's, what's the best now isn't going to be the best tomorrow, necessarily. So I think that um, you know, you'll have to, I, I encourage you to read the regulations when they come out. And I also want to say that for different, for different aspects of it, I mean, there's a lot, um, you know, in, for instance, in produce, there's a, there's a, you know, you're going to see a lot more, a lot of detail um, in terms of in, in different areas on how to control hazards. It's not as if we're just saying, writing a regulation that says, OK, you're making, you know, you're, you're growing spinach. Please do it safely. I mean, there's going to be a lot more to it than that. So I encourage you to read the regulations when they come out. Um, we hope to have our preventive controls regulations out this fall. Um, and um, I'm sorry, our preve did I say preventive controls? Our preventive controls regulations, our goal is really to try to get them out this fall. Produce is, um, the, the statutory deadline is in January, and we're working furiously um, to meet that. And we will try to meet that as closely as possible. But I would encourage you. I think that you will, um, you will I, I think you will think differently when you see the regulation. If I gave the impression we're doing very high level brush strokes, um, that's not it. We are giving a lot of meat to our regulations. And again, then, I, then the, the idea is then we write guidances that help industry even further to help evaluate their hazards and control them. So I would encourage all of you to read the regulations and, and sort of submit comments you have, um, if, if you have comments, um, and get involved in the regulatory process. OK. Great. Thank you very much, and, uh, both for Dr. Nachman and for um, Ms. Mail. We really appreciate your great presentation. And um, we invite all of you to join us again next month on October 12th for our next public health practice grand rounds on the new tobacco warning labels. OK? Thank you very much. Thank you.